Um, essentially, I guess um, Agile Associates, which is my uh, architectural company, is been working to begin with predominantly in the in the domestic realm. We started like most uh, companies in London, really by uh, getting our patronage through uh, small commissions, and then um, sort of I guess uh, uh, sort of something which comes as a result of the Blairite project. A positive part of it was that um, uh, we were able to win quite a lot of public projects in the UK, which led to us being able to kind of compete internationally for work. So that's a kind of quick summary. Um, I wanted to talk what became the work, the sort of thesis behind the work is sort of developed through making. It's not been a sort of a thesis driven agenda whereby um, this has been thought about and then somehow implemented. It's come from the other way around. And in a way, in each project, there's a search to try and find out what it is we're actually doing, what it is that we're actually trying to achieve. And if this doesn't happen, in the project, we, we try not to take them on. <laughs> okay. Um, so, some successful projects. <laughs> um, in houses, I am specifically interested in the notion of new topology. Um, this is something that a lot of young architects are also interested in. Um, but also I'm very interested in the notion of the private realm within the house, the notion of the retreat. Um, and this is really very directly as a response to a public realm which I see as an opportunity of a certain kind of porosity. So I will start with really um, this house which I call the lost house um, in London, which is a situation whereby one had to make a house out of a topology that nobody would imagine, I, I think, and, and then move on to a project in uh, the US for a new kind of uh, uh, sort of building for two artists, well, studio building, but a, a studio building that's a new build, not, an, an, uh, not a found situation, something which I think hasn't happened for about 150 years, 100 years, especially in Europe anyway. Um, and then talk about uh, four public projects. Um, this is the site of the Lost House. It's in King's Cross, sorry, I can't point, but you can sort of get a sense of um, the sort of central block in that area, and that's the building there. This is um, right on the edge of the canal systems that you know, was an incredible network that provided London with its incredible sort of industrial uh, revolution uh, sort of you know, power in the 19th century. Um, London was the sort of conduit, the terms of the conduit with the series of canals which kind of took everything up um, to, you know, as far as, uh, you know, uh, Newcastle, you know, uh, it's amazing what that canal network did. Anyway, there's in incredible structures, warehouse structures which were built all around these. In the 80s and 90s, these structures became um, very much desirable uh, luxury homes. My client, though, sort of being last to try and jump into this uh, phenomena, um, kind of came about uh, this site, which is between the main building and the smaller uh, warehouse building. This is a new sort of development which was put on top of these warehouses. Um, found the driveway, the loading bay site. And that, that arch you see is the loading bay site for the warehouse. And um, nobody thought that that would be a useful space to make a home, but my client, who's a fashion designer, thought that they would ask um, and managed to purchase it and approached me to develop a home for them. Um, sorry. The, um, uh, we managed to secure planning permission from it and really developed this, a house which is buried between two buildings and sort of spans across two roads. Now, the client, with the homes, I also try to kind of bring in a sense of autobiography, uh, sort of a very autobiographical quality to the homes um, in a way to try and kind of use that as a driver to uh, research um, uh, specific issues about the notion of domesticity and retreat so that it's not generic but absolutely tuned to the user in some way. Um, this is the plan of the house, um, one end being the street, the other being the other street, and you can imagine that that was the tr through route of the loading bay. Um, the house is organized around three courtyards, uh, one at the front, which is sort of the stripe thing, one in the middle, which is the square in the middle, and then one at the back, and they are thematically placed. But the exploration, uh, the discussion with this fashion designer was to try and develop a home whereby the notion of a private space would be one in which you would see light, 
not have light sort of reflected around you as an ambiance. So the project was about trying to understand light as a physical phenomena which can be placed in a house, something you can observe, and then also to use the background in this environment as a place in which she could work and live, but look at things. Her work is actually incredibly colorful. So in the end, the house became a way of exploring um, not reflected light, which is very much the modernist canon, but actually light as phenomena, physical phenomena, which kind of falls very specifically into spaces, and also a neutral background um, in which color and uh, detail can be seen in a new way. Um, this is just looking at the section where you just see how different levels are manipulated. I'm sorry, I can't point, so I can't really specifically say, but you, we just uh, played with the levels of the loading bay sort of structure and then put in this new uh, moss roof. Uh, the moss roof became a kind of landscape for the residents up above, and that was the negotiation which finally secured this. They were happy with this exchange that we gave them the garden and then um, our clients could build this house. Um, what you're seeing is basically since the house is quite deep moving underneath um, the existing buildings, we had to develop sort of tentacles, light tentacles, which kind of draw light deep into parts of the plan. What you're looking at is a section from where uh, there's a swimming pool, which goes into a bedroom, which then comes into the living room, and the way in which light is drawn through. And then um, pieces of furniture and the detailing of the space. This is the roof plan, looking at those three primary cuts and then the secondary cuts. And this is the first view. The, the first court is, um, we called it an air court. So really it was a way of um, mitigating the outside uh, world, making a screen, and then having a chamber of air, really, sort of dimensioned in the space. And then moving into the space, which is a space with about 15 shades of black, um, sort of going through it, and then this architectural furniture which was then, um, she designed incredible sort of soft pieces to go over. We just designed the infrastructure and she developed this, the enclosure. So this became the front of the house. We left everything as it was, we just made a, a base and then the screen, which starts this new layering. This is the rear court before it's planted. It's finally full of um, North Atlantic uh, green plants. So it became a mound in the end, so it's a kind of earth growing mound at the back. Um, this is a second entrance to the building. This is looking at the piece of furniture that we made for the main space. The furniture acts as one element throughout that long space from the front to the back, sort of terminating in this kitchen. It's always a continuous piece, and it's just cast out of concrete. The, set, the middle court is a court which articulates, I guess, the whole house in which this armature, this piece of furniture wraps around. Um, the court is a water court. It's, um, it has lilies in it now. Um, and it's just a sort of space where it, when it snows, when it rains, it's quite an amazing vitrine to sort of observe nature. Um, this is looking back at the front. I'm just going to go through it. Then flipping, this is in the rooms with these light scoops, these tentacles that draw light from the main courtyard. This is underneath the existing part of the building where we just expose the old concrete, which we thought was very particular and special bathrooms, a TV sort of play area, which is a green carpet cut in the space. Um, the roof of the buildings, looking at these tentacles, which connects back to the bedrooms, the light which ends. Okay, second project is this building that we just completed for two artists in um, Brooklyn, in New York. It's my first project in America. Um, we sort of find ourselves working in America quite a bit right now, which is um, very exciting for us. Um, a very different social condition, very different way of reading the context. But uh, these are two artists whom I really admire, and um, I was very uh, grateful that they asked me to make their project for them. I don't know if you know Brooklyn. Brooklyn is a grid, sort of another part of that sort of um, grid idea, but it's a grid of names, um, and it's a distorting grid. Um, a series of terraces, very famous brownstones. This is a typical sort of linear site. This is what Brooklyn looks like. Very much a hangout. That sort of distorted grid creates very interesting informal spaces on the corners of streets. Very 
I guess, moments of sort of social activity, sort of social engagement. These are the two artists. Um, one's Lorna, Sim Lorna Simpson, who works with um, issues of gender, um, uh, feminism, and uh, notions of black identity. Um, and James Casabir, who works with notions of perceptions in space. These are all fictions. He recreates spaces of terror or spaces of um, oppression or these, these notions of kind of spaces that are not supposed to be beautiful and reconstructs them out of card and photographs them and presents them as sort of these depositories of space that get sort of left. Um, so their house, you know, how to make a building for them, which is a double studio. They wanted to have uh, a space where both creatives would work together. They live around the corner. They both lived in Brooklyn and they had studios in Manhattan but wanted to move away from that. So they bought this land and commissioned this double studio. So it was about putting one on top of the other. And how to make this project whilst looking both at their work was, in the end, I finally sort of came upon this idea of working within the limits of systems and techniques and to try and use a technique which happens within old buildings, studio buildings, which is this notion of appropriation as a way of making a design negotiation. So you would not try to question, for instance, the engineer saying the span of that beam needed to be you know, half a meter deep or whatever it was because you had a window in the way, but you would use all his parameters as a way of negotiating distortion, slippage, um, and try to kind of make distortions within the plan. Not major distortions, but very nuanced distortions which are very much at the human scale. It's very difficult to photograph, but it's sort of throughout the plan, there are quirks and things that are occurring which don't seem normal. So this is the section whereby by the time you get to the top, the, the form of the building is crumpling, folding, almost as though there's a kind of pressure up above. And um, below, it's uh, almost like a sort of modernist 1920s idea of a kind of studio perfect studio, and this falls into a garden space. And the notion of the uh, public face and the sort of private face have to do two very different sort of Janus-like conditions. So it's looking at a section, looking at the way the staircases work. So this is the two double studios, the cube on the bottom and a distorted cube up above, and then this is the building. The building is made with this um, frame, which is basically just clad in plasterboard and concrete and stained wood dark stained, dark stained concrete, dark stained wood. And the building is enveloped in um, polypropylene, which is a, a sort of material developed for the transport industry to line trucks to keep the stability in the temperature. But we've been testing this material to use on, on, a, on a building. This is the first use of it, really, where we screen printed it with a black screen printing process that gave us a random wash across it. And then we sort of moved it across so that you get this sort of movement when you, also, when you sort of alternate the paneling, almost like veneer. And then this is the building in its context. Um, so this very private building, but somehow um, being on the border of a notion of, you know, for me, you'll see in the other work, I, uh, the public work is very explicitly porous and very sort of, um, not loud, but much more um, active in its kind of engagement with the public and when it's about private or semi-private public, uh, semi-private projects, this notion of a, a sort of blur becomes very interesting to me. And the studio is very much this notion of the blur for me. It's, a, it's this idea of a kind of hermetic space for creativity, but somehow something which is also about a work life. So in a way, this notion of the building as a ghost is very interesting to me. This is the rear, sort of the opposite to that, the sort of the aperture to the garden. This is the entry. And you can start to see the sort of nuances that are occurring because of the things that I was talking about earlier. Looking back, um, some of the notions that were developed in the Lost House are picked up here, ways of picking up light informally and framing views. This is looking up that first void when you come into the space. And it almost has a kind of glacial quality, maybe referencing um, Jim's work in a way indirectly. Then from the back, looking at the house, uh, studio from the back, this double space, and this massive uh, party walls, which I really wanted to accentuate, this notion of this double terrace, then making this port. Um, and then upstairs, 
double stair. This is where beams suddenly interrupt the structure. We just allowed it to happen and just work around it. Um, the higher space, as you see apertures which go out to the windows, the roof of the main studio space up above with its tracking, distorting skylights. This is from that top floor down. Looking back at its hermetic space. Um, uh, next project I want to talk about, now this is really talking about this notion of the public porosity. Um, you'll probably notice that they have very different, almost schizophrenic sort of uh, behavior in my private and public projects. And I try to explore them very much as this duality and not to get them mixed. I'm sort of very uninterested in a kind of singular uh, singularity of a sort of architecture which drives across both public and private realm. I try to kind of distinguish a kind of public performance of the architecture and the private retreat of um, domestic architecture or architecture which is in that private realm. Um, I don't know if you know Denver, but actually Z referred to Boulder. Boulder is in Colorado. <laughs> it's a, a mile high um, above sea level, so it's an incredibly beautiful nature there, incredibly beautiful climate. It's about this incredible light. Very, in a way, it has a Cape Town type feel, but the Rocky Mountains which surround Denver are much further away. The site is the last piece of development, the gray, um, of a sort of big developer master plan, and it's the Contemporary Art Museum for the city. So it's non-collecting and it's a Kunsthalle. Um, something which comes to play very much in the public projects are sort of devices, conceptual devices, which I use as kind of generative drivers. Um, there's a huge discussion that we made, but essentially the notion of the Kunsthalle was to be explored um, beyond the idea of um, a big flexible technological plate room with systems that would divide it. But the notion of flexibility would be in the inherent way one proportion the space and then, and then uh, proportion systems which would then be interlinked by a, a sort of beam. And for me, this headrest um, is a very important tool. Um, so the notion of this, what could be just a shed space became this idea of making three volumes which are enclosed by a major volume, vertically um, articulated with a, a wrapping root around it. Simply, the volume, for me, when I make these public projects, the performance of the form very much derives from a kind of relational understanding of the site. So for me, the corner becomes a very important um, accentuated urban condition, especially in a, an American context where the notion of the public is very, very loose and really hardly there. Um, it's very much a kind of public in the kind of, um, um, it's very much a kind of label of public rather than a real participatory public, which um, I try to counter with these works. Um, it's a bit distorted, but um, you can see this notion of these three boxes, three volumes, which er erupt on the roof eventually, and uh, in a way, Acknowledge the corner condition, which is the largest gathering point. The building is not entered through the center, but off the corner, there is no door. There's a dissolve that occurs where the green that you see wrapping around spirals to the top is an extension of that public plane, which just goes right up to a pavilion which overlooks the city. And so in a way, the kind of museum is seen as a, as a space, a public event space for an exchange with um, things hopefully that inspire you or stimulate you or make you angry. The building is very simply organized around these three volumes, which you see becoming more clear as you go up the building. The beam is sort of around this, the sort of three core enclosure pieces that you see in the first floor plan. And it's a translucent chamber um, which wraps around these solid spaces. And it also performs as an environmental container, um, um, which allows us to make a building which I think for the, uh, is basically one uses no light in its top floors, only uses light at night because we are articulating the sunlight perfectly, reduces its energy consumption by making this double wall construction, um, et cetera. And it's, I think, going to be the first, something in America which they call gold standard, this Leeds gold standard, which is an environmental badge they give. It'll be the first museum which has this. The building has a folly on the top, which is this form which cantilevers off. This is the entrance, which is really very much a dissolved shutter space. So it's a passage that you're invited to come up. 
then this rooftop condition, which is the end of the journey where you have a member's pavilion which overlooks the city. The building is clad in a reflective gray glass. Um, it's, and then lined with a clear uh, polypropylene membrane on the inside. Um, I'm going to show these two libraries, which um, have been a major project for the office for the last three years. Um, and this project, um, I'm going to show them very quickly, are uh, two uh, attempts by a local authority to address the notion of the library as an institution, a public institution in, um, um, in its community. Uh, Tower Hamlets is where these buildings are. Uh, Tower Hamlets has the largest diversity of uh, diaspora uh, people in, in Britain. Uh, I think there's something like, I think, is it um, 18 languages being spoken there, which is incredible. Um, and um, essentially what you have is an amazing sort of uh, diaspora which has kind of come to a working class um, area of, um, of, of, the, of the East End, which is very close to the city, Canary Wharf, the images up above. And actually within this kind of incredible um, fuzziness of public life, because these communities which have been coming to the East End f over the past sort of 500 years, specifically settling in the East End, came much fast, much slower before. It was like every 100 years. In the last sort of, um, sort of 60 years has kind of accelerated at such a pace that it's incredible to track, really. Um, and what became clear is that there's a dis disconglobulating of these communities from any central ideas, any central identity. So um, the notion of libraries or the institutions that normally operate within these contexts to kind of bring people together started to fall apart because these communities became self-help sort of communities retreating into their own systems and not really integrating or kind of negotiating or kind of becoming part of the collective culture, whatever that might be. Um, so when we were asked to come and make these uh, projects, the council was very much, we won the competition, we made a presentation, and I'll go through it. Um, the, the notion was to really try and address this notion of a disenfranchised uh, set of communities um, around this notion of reading as an important kind of uh, public institution which edifies communities, and to kind of also within that understand that maybe the notion of the library was no longer the relevant model but a new notion of a kind of community center was what was going to operate here. Um, what they came up with was this idea of calling these libraries idea stores. And the reason was basically they would now combine lifelong learning and, uh, and adult education services and community council service together into one, to one building. Um, and the building would function as a kind of uh, a sort of piece of infrastructure that people could use on different levels, obviously erased from its traditional memory and taking on new associative memories um, with that community, a sort of, a sort of kick start. Um, I was kind of fascinated by the notion of the market, which is the one place where all the communities gather together, and also very much, inf sort of very much trying to kind of develop a syntax which would be working against the notion of a classical model which sets up a kind of ordering system, a perfecting ordering system, and to try and find an informal ordering system. And, I, and to, to think about communities as a woven structure, um, whereby I, I became very interested in diagonal making patterns of um, African textiles. So in this particular project, the notion of a random system, um, uh, random generating cladding system random generating space making idea became a very important driver. The building is very much again, as I discussed, just determined by its uh, context, but here very specifically, I wanted to laminate the building very specifically within its context, not to make it a standalone um, object, because it's in the site of a very important post-war development, heroic community development um, about how you make a piece of urban infrastructure. So the building sits directly on top of a very dense urban condition and really archaeologically beds itself onto that site, doesn't try to make judgments and value um, sort of posturings against anything around it. It just sort of accepts it and says it's another thing. It's very simply the end of a shopping uh, strip, which then makes a public room, which brings you up onto a big, large hall with um, an open library system of... Uh, 
shelves which are around the windows and walls, and then teaching spaces and uh, sort of uh, staff spaces to one side. It's a very simple plan. And then this is the image of the building in its context. The building deliberately uses glass as a counter to um, the opaque quality of the brick and the concrete, and to use this notion of um, the colors which are found locally. The markets in all of Tower Hamlets use pink, green, blue, um, and white as their sort of signature. And this signature for me was very important to use almost in a kind of, like a sort of, uh, almost like a Klaus Oldenburg way, just to take a very simple, banal, apparently superficial idea and to elevate it um, and to make it a kind of proposition for a way of making a popular myth about community. So it becomes a way of um, using that double color motif and fading it across as many variables as we could afford to make this weaving, shifting kind of structure which laminates itself onto this context. This is the public room, which is the entrance, which lifts you up. We designed everything, the furniture, the budget was extremely cheap, so we, we ended up making everything. And all these forms are relational forms to do with disability, but we didn't want to kind of articulate them in a traditional way, so it's about how disabled uh, chairs, uh, disabled wheelchairs can park next to desks, etc. cetera. Um, furniture, this is the library. We dissolved the notion of the library with its linear regimented space, turned them into a series of landscape propositions. Um, so the hall really has these curvilinear systems which make subspaces for people. Um, and then the uh, spaces, um, we developed all the children's furniture. Um, here you see a class um, with a group in France just to really try and articulate a certain kind of uniformity across this space. The classrooms you can see on the other side. So this is a really interesting kind of new model for a library where you can see people learning motor mechanics, doing yoga, flower arranging and reading books and listening to DVDs. And then the idea of the facade really working very hard. The glass is reversed on the inside. It becomes very much this timber uh, environment. The timber is laminated. It's all recycled timber. There's no natural timber. It's all laminated junk timber, as most people uh, sometimes refer to it. It's timber that's used in structures to be hidden, and they're just sanded and cleaned up. This is the first building. And in a way, it makes a kind of very interesting relationship to the, um, what was, for this community, the sort of rich city people on the other side. It sort of does a kind of very strange landscape borrowing trick by dropping a kind of very distorted glass version right on top of them. Um, so that the notion of us and them becomes very, very blurred and no longer so easily polemical. The second building, we were commissioned to do both at the same time, so they were, both systems were developed at the same time and were built consecutively. And we, we proposed this deliberately to our client as a way of making, uh, getting a very economic strategy out of the building process. Um, we were able to then negotiate because um, if, we did, if we'd done this singularly, we would never have been able to get the cladding contractors for the prices that we had this project for. So we were able to kind of use the kind of collective power of the project to negotiate much bigger potential, sort of bringing in people from different parts of Europe to work on it. This is uh, Whitechapel High Street, where the second building is. The second building, again, actually faces the city, the new symbol of the city, which is the Gherkin, which you can see. And also, the key area where the public works is this strip, um, this market strip, which goes all the way to Whitechapel High Street um, in London, which is a very important, buzzy place. So here, the notion of the diagonal system becomes tessellated into a um, five-story structure, um, where the diagonals become very, very pronounced, and the shifting nuances become um, much clearer to do with elevations. The building becomes this cloak, which um, has really at its center the idea of driving everything into a spine system, a sort of making almost like a body architecture, where you have the service stairs, the, the, all the entire system sort of running through the center, so that you leave the entire building free from any systems of um, circulation, or you know, there are no escape stairs, etc. wrapping around this building. It's a four-sided building. It sits within this 
context, a 19th century context. And then uh, the notion of how this building performs is again another distortion of a very simple cube which overarches the street so that the notion of the entry is completely dissolved whereby when you use that market and you're passing it every day you are sort of imbricated into the, um, the structure of the building because there's a cavity which opens up which is this beige in front where you look up into the building and also where escalators can take you straight off the street plane up so we decided we didn't want to make one single entry, but to make a multiple porous building, which would act very much as a piece of infrastructure for the community without any kind of formal, sort of singular kind of uh, signature. The building is very simply organized. It's this, you get this very deep core. So it looks like a big fat building, but actually it's because the core is so big, you end up with a very standard plate size which wraps around it. Um, on the ground floor you have the stacks, children's libraries, DVD libraries. First floor you have dance space, complementary therapy, terrace, creche, computer surfing spaces, classrooms, and then the escalators which take you up. And as you go up you have more classrooms, reference library, reading rooms. It gets quieter as you go up, essentially. And then you end in reverse with a cafe which overlooks the entire city. This is the building on the street. So this is this moment that I was talking about, this form which overarcs the streetscape. And this is this moment when you are underneath the structure as you pass it. This is this market closing. So the relationship to the market becomes clear and this ability to choose. As a library user, of course, you, f you have very specific routes that you take as you use this, this institution because, of course, either you're referencing or you're just browsing. And when you, if it's your local facility, you just know exactly where you need to go. So this notion of having to go through one single port is no longer necessary. This is also further facilitated by the idea that you no longer need to have a sort of single person checking you in and out because all the library users have smart cards. So they're all checking in and out on every floor. What you have is almost like a cash point machine where you check yourself in and out. So the notion of a singular centrally controlled library totally no longer operates. Building. The building is also set up with a, a significant amount of infrastructure. The sort of nuances that you see wrapping the building are hardwired for LED and, and uh, uh, sort of projection systems, which will come um, as the organization gets more. Um, there's, I mean, the main video screen is coming as a negotiation with the hospital, which is across the road, who want to kind of show and share um, health uh, facilities, health information with the library, um, the idea store. Inside, the building is um, uh, a concrete frame building. It has incredible mass, which reduces the energy consumption very much. So it's, it performs incredibly well, even though it uses quite a large amount of glass. It's not actually a glass building, because behind the glass is an insulated sort of system, which makes it look like it's glass. It's really glass cladding, um, which um, is sort of on the outside. Um, when, you en when you enter, another thing that I wanted to move away from was the monumentality that's um, proposed by most classical and mostly neoclassical buildings where the kind of the sense of the kind of drama of the triple quadruple height space becomes the way in which you make a certain kind of civicness. And to really counter that by making very human scale relational proportional cuts near the entry. So the building is not about a kind of fantastical gesture. It's about nuanced little sort of moments which hopefully give you something special and intimate. The dance space at the back. The entire room is either this laminated recycled timber or relaminated paper, compressed fibrous paper, which is just painted. The main staircase which is also the escape staircase. We spent all the money making these glazed screens at the end. I don't know if you know about this sort of thing, but so that we could make the staircase, the escape staircase, the main stair. And a building this size, we'd have to have four staircases. We decided to develop two and make them work very hard so they, it's a double helix, they never join, but you think you always see them as you go around the building because they're glazed ends. A space which overlooks the city, it's probably the one public space where you can just go and see the entire city for free and hang out the whole day. It has its own environmental condition where we made these skylights which retract automatically to make a sort of outdoor space of that cafe. And it's the only room in that building. The building is not air conditioned, it's, uh, it's conditioned by drawing air from above not working with the pollution off the street, which is highly polluted, 
but drawing air and using evaporative spray, sort of cooled water to cool down the building and then pumping it through the floor. There are no ducts in the building. It's all cast in situ structure. Nobel Peace Center. This is another commission we won several years ago, which is an incredible commission for us to have won. It was one of those incredible projects where the Nobel are this secret organization where nobody knows, nobody knows who they are, what they do, or who it is as the client base. We got a fax. <laughs> it says, Dear Mr. Ajay, you have been selected. <laughs> and you kind of don't believe it. You're like, okay. And um, it's, you know, people turn up. <laughs> and before you know it, you're in an interview room with a panel. And yeah, we won the competition, which was amazing. But what was kind of extraordinary is that um, most people know the, the piece, there's two, well, obviously there's two prizes, the science prize, and, well, there's two key prizes. The science prize, which most people know, there's the literature prize, which is kind of affiliated indirectly with that. And then there's the peace prize, which has always been in Norway. And Alfred Nobel, who really developed this as a kind of redemption for his own soul, because he was a dynamite, he's the guy who invented dynamite and was a major kind of, <laughs> major guy who kind of, uh, was instrumental in kind of making World War II kind of happen with a really big bang. World War I, sorry, <laughs> happened with a really big bang. <laughs> I mean, it's sort of like this irony of this man. <laughs> anyway, so he decided that he would make some more conflict by splitting the, piece, the prize, the foundation, between Sweden and Norway, who are traditional enemies. So the notion of peace really is something which is understood through the notion of conflict, and this is it being manifest completely. So <laughs> Sweden's always had its place, its building, which was always a celebratory space, but Norway never had one, and so um, this was about Norway getting its own space. The problem with the Peace Prize is that, unlike a traditional archive, a museum, or a sort of archive of the city, there are no objects, it's just data. Most of this information, this is Oslo, this is the Vespan, this is my site. Um, most of the information of the Nobel laureates are clippings from newspapers, or radio, or TV. So how the hell do you make a, a museum an archive for this kind of institution became the real challenge. Because essentially you don't need a building in, if we follow the kind of logic of it. Because essentially the notion of space is irrelevant, it's just about data and obviously we all have computers so we can access this, blah, blah, blah. Obviously this does not work. What is incredibly clear was that hundreds of people kept turning up in Oslo to visit the mythical Peace Museum that didn't exist. And they would end at the door of the offices of the Peace Prize, where they left the medal because it was getting so silly. And they would usher two people in at a time, <laughs> feed them out. And this went on for years, where <laughs> they kind of didn't know what to do and just give online sort of <laughs> references. So this notion of space is incredibly somehow psycholog psychologically important to us as human beings. <laughs> and the notion of a kind of spatial um, Narrative within all the kind of, uh, you know, all our public life somehow seems to be the powerful way in which we still make cities. So this was a kind of very interesting analysis that we were confronted with. So the notion of making a project for me became very interesting because I wanted, um, within this notion of data, to conceptualize a notion of discrete, powerful, singular spaces choreographed, obviously not using a narrative which would be a formal way of making a building, but one which proposed singular contained systems which would work in a new kind of edit, a new way of understanding threshold, consecutively together to make a kind of powerful landscape. And so, uh, you know, this reference to Dogon is a very powerful one, this idea of singular unit, sort of elementizing, not a kind of elaboration of plan with, uh, uh, with many sort of uh, variables but singular systems which have their own unique identity. So how to work with this building? The building was listed. It's the only building that wasn't uh, leveled by the Luftwaffe. So it was in that area of Oslo. So it has incredible symbolic importance to the city. So um, you couldn't touch it even though there was nothing there to actually really preserve. So we had to work with this idea of a building with memory but without any content. Um, and so these installations, as I call them, starting from the outside and ending up at the top of the building, sort of in a way became the way in which one understood the project. I sketch a lot and make models. Um, it's kind of principally how I work. And then, and then we explore the models in the computer. So we try to photograph the models and then work with them in the computer. So it's a very perverse way around, but that's how we work. Um, so this collection, you can see this is a sort of sequence drawing which shows the collection somehow infecting the building. 
and completing the sequence and the rereading of the building. So this is kind of quickly going through the plans, which is not necessary, but because I'll just go through the spaces. But you can imagine there is a sequence of almost viral-like pavilions which kind of infect the entire building. Essentially, it culminates in this. We didn't want to put a sign on the building. We wanted to spatially choreograph the entire experience, not through graphic um, sort of lettering, but through spatial to try and see how new, you know, how sensitive the audience was through a spatial choreography. So the beginning, the building is sort of signaled by a chamber, which you pass through, which is deposited in front of the structure, um, nothing written on it. And what you realize when you pass through it is that it's a map of the world where you shift the notion of panoptic relationship to um, the world to one of a spatial engaged one. It's basically a map which surrounds you of the land mass and water mass, which you see again at the end of the sequence. And that's it sort of looking up. It sort of becomes a kind of element, a sort of thing which negotiates a certain kind of publicness. People use it to kiss under. At Valentine's Day, I was getting tons of emails about people using it as a meeting spot, which was incredibly sweet. <laughs> so um, just a very nice little thing. Things happen that you sometimes don't plan. Um, it's a raw aluminum structure which sits in this community. In the middle of the building, you have an acoustic version, an inversion of that, which is in the main hall. And it's basically all this, the, double, the major and minor city of, the, uh, of all the capitals, all the major cities in the world. And they're wrapped into another chamber, which goes floor, wall, ceilings. And each one has every month uh, a, re, an, a, a sort of small 15-minute uh, play of, 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 of the news, the sounds from that place, playing through tiny speakers and a lens in the, in the, in the, in the, in the structure. It's, it's a resin cast structure. And then you basically, you find, it's amazing, adults kind of think, ooh, a bit strange, but foreboding. Children run to it and drop all over it. It's basically about an audible scenario, and it's amazing to see 30 children kind of with their ears pit, sort of plastered against the structure, listening to different voices, different languages, essentially around the world. So by the time you've got into the sort of threshold, you've already experienced the notion of the world in a different way, and hopefully this notion of difference in a different way. And then you go into the entrance, which is bright red. Um, and the bright red is, in a comical way, using this very simplistic idea of, uh, really for me, this notion of understanding peace through conflict as a way of kind of disrupting your comfort by making a, a, a kind of an alert color, which can be sensuous and beautiful, or if you kind of look at it within its kind of lingu you know, linguistic code, is about a kind of an alert mode. Um, you then proceed from this into the environments which are about... Um, experiencing the Peace Prize. When we uh, uh, finished Wangeshi, uh, Wangari Mutu as uh, the, uh, the prize winner, That's somebody who I met and find incredibly inspiring. Anyway, chamber number one is a golden tunnel where you are, the entire chamber is reflective. So you get this notion of the metal and the personality in this kaleidoscopic sort of dreamlike space and this notion of a kind of winning the prize as a quite a kind of special event. A simple exhibition space, which is a black box space, where we stripped the entire ceiling off and made a kind of technology grid up above where theater performance tanks could be rolled up. An informal protest space, which uses discarded junk wood from Norway to reconstruct it, which is just stained. Uh, a live link satellite room to make communication with different parts of the world and to show films protest, sort of art house uh, protest films. The main room in the exhibition space, which is a chamber of the laureates, which is a space which I developed with a, an amazing technologist called David Small from MIT, where we made a garden, a digital garden, where you have all the laureates um, in a space on these small LCD screens with uh, fiber optic stalks, and the entire room is activated by sonar so that you never need to touch the technology, you just come up to it and it starts to scroll information to you about each laureate. So as you approach it, it changes color and then starts to scroll information. And if you stay, it gives you more information and as you move away, it refreshes and goes back to its reset mode. So really it becomes this very sensory um, garden space of these laureates and as the laureates are sort of given prizes, you know, as they grow, we, we've made it so that they can grow to 150 in here and then we, we think that our job's sort of done. 
The End is a cafe where um, the artist Chris Ophelia collaborated with me to make a sort of a termination point of the experience that we're talking about. These are all the cities of the world connected by lines to make a kind of map which fills the cafe space, the end space of the sequence. And so the fragments which are left, as you can see you going through the whole thing, are left in situ so that they become fragments floating within this new sort of odyssey of singular spaces which are abutting each other. And then at night, this thing illuminates, and that's the sign and the symbol for the Nobel. Last project, um, another kind of public building, is a pavilion in Venice that we were commissioned to make with an artist called Olafur Eliasson, uh, an Icelandic artist who's really based in, well, his home's in Denmark, but his studio's in Berlin. And um, he's interested in the phenomena of light. And, uh, and this foundation called TBA21 is a, an incredible foundation which commissions um, and collects art which is not easily collectible and collects art by artists who are interested in the notion of making art which is not about necessarily making objects or necessarily making collectible scenar you know, scenarios for a commercial sort of, uh, um, sort of gay. And it's the idea of making art as a kind of social process or in a, a kind of an edifying sort of uh, strategy. And this foundation is completely committed to supporting this kind of art and to somehow in a way find ways of addressing how one re-presents uh, this for the public. So we were brought in as architects to work with Olafur. Olafur had made a work he developed a te uh, technology, adapted a technology, an Air Force technology, to record the light um, of any um, region um, and to turn that light into light tapes. So in Venice, he specifically programmed the tool to collect light from dusk to dawn of the Laguna. Um, this, is, this place is an amazing place, um, right on the way from the Giardini to the Lido, um, if you know Venice. And it's this Armenian monastery with this very beautiful rose garden around it. Now, the monks only made rose jam as a way of sort of <laughs> making some kind of profit um, to sustain this place. And now the rent from this pavilion is what's kind of sustaining this incredible place, which has only got 10 monks left. But they look after this. And if you come out to it, it's open 24 hours of the day. You can just go to this building. Um, the light tape, essentially, is made into uh, 14 minutes long. It's, a, it's almost like, imagine 40, uh, the, the day sped up into 14 minutes from the sort of incredible purple blues of the morning to the sort of nuanced whites of the day to the yellows and reds of the evening. And it's a cycle. And then it's made into a three millimeter slot. So imagine the daylight, which is fi approximately 5,000 lux, coming through a three millimeter slot and placed into a dark space. The work is called Your Black Horizon. And so for me, conceptually, when I worked, met Olafur, this, this was a very important trigger. I said, here we were trying to make a horizon within a container, uh, within a device which would also moderate and mediate the world. And I kept, for me, the comb was a very important symbol, um, encapsulating these three apparently contradictory systems. The building is incredibly simple. It's about how to kind of enter a structure so that you don't break the horizon. So it's a series of gentle ramps which modulate the inside and outside and also bring you into this horizon. Oh, it's a bit broken up, but I should go on. It's a very simple building with three ramps. You come into a foyer space, it's always open, and then you rise into the chamber, and then in that chamber is the horizon. This is approaching it. It's made out of cheap pine and corrugated paper, black corrugated paper. and then the timber is recycled, cheap sterling board. It's set up on axes with one o'clock so that as you come into this louver space, you have um, basically um, sort of one o'clock light marking the space. This is looking back. Then as you enter the ramp, you see this white, fierce light, which causes incredible afterburn, retinal afterburn, but as you get used to it, it becomes quite hallucinatory and quite <laughs> quite trippy, <laughs> but very beautiful. <laughs> so, I mean, this is using a lot of bright light. You can't actually see anything. All you see is this horizon line, which changes color, sort of oscillating around you, flying around you. Um, it's, it's quite a powerful thing to experience. 
and then leaving and going back into the world and the building. Thank you very much for listening.